Before we get started, I'd like to recognize some special guests we have with us this evening. I'll begin with our Board of Trustees, Governor Pete Wilson and his wife, Gail. Governor, Gail, thank you. Our newest trustee of the Reagan Foundation, Andrew Littlefair and his wife, Karen. Andrew, okay. Our outstanding Congressman, Elton Gallagher and his wife, Janice. Elton. I think we have uh, Congressman Andy Harris from Maryland's first district here today. Andy, thank you. From the California State Assembly, representing the 38th District, Assemblyman and Mrs. Cameron Smythe. <laughs> Ventura County Supervisor Peter Foy and Ventura Clerk and Recorder Mark Lunn. Gentlemen. <laughs> From the great city of Simi Valley, City Manager Mike Sedell, Councilman Mike Judge, Councilman Glenn Becerra, and Councilwoman Barbara Williamson. And from the city of Agora, Councilman Dennis Weber. Dennis, I think great to see you. Of course, Mrs. Chris Christie and Chris's brother Todd. And finally, the director of the Reagan Library, Mr. Duke Blackwood. Duke. Thank you all for coming. Well, I have had the honor to serve Mrs. Reagan and the Reagan Foundation for over two years. And in that time, there is one question I have fielded more than any other. And it is, who is the next Ronald Reagan? It's a question I know is on the minds of a lot of people, particularly in times like this, when the economy appears to be in a shambles, the nation's balance sheet could not look more bleak, and our place of leadership in the world stage is openly questioned. It takes us all back to a time 30 years ago when, what was it, a malaise had set in over the land, and then President Jimmy Carter was openly questioning whether our country still had the national will to succeed. Ronald Reagan answered the question. Of course we did. So then, who is the next Ronald Reagan? We would probably do well to ask the world's leading authority on the subject, someone who knew him throughout his life like no other, and who was at his side every step of the way, our great former First Lady Nancy Reagan. Now, I have not put the question to her before, but I imagine her answer would be something like this. You can stop searching. There will never be another Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> of course, she would be right. But with certainty, there are leaders in our country today who were called to service and who have set their own compass based on the, on the ideals that President Reagan stood for. They have learned over the years to talk the talk. Some, a very few, have gone further. They have had the courage, as far as Ronald Reagan's principles go, to, well, walk the walk. One of those is with us today. He is the governor of New Jersey, and his name is Chris Christie. Elected in November 2009, he set about the process of plugging an $11 billion hole in a state budget of $29 billion by actually reducing the size of government, cutting spending, eliminating regulations, and reducing taxes. He has worked successfully with Republicans and Democrats, adhered to conservative principles, taken on unions, and attacked runaway entitlement programs. 
Sound like Ronald Reagan? It's no wonder that some of our nation's most successful businessmen, entrepreneurs, and political leaders have blazed a well-worn path to his doorstep, urging him to jump into the race for president. <laughs> well, his repeated answer, I need more experience, to which his supporters complain, you can't say you're not ready. Look at Barack Obama. <laughs> Coining a response that will go down in political folklore, the governor coolly replies, yeah, look at him. <laughs> I am fully convinced that those longing for Governor Christie to lead our nation are not after him solely, as some pundits would suggest, because they are dissatisfied with the field. Rather, it is the case that they are rightly impressed with him. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Governor Chris Christie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Mrs. Reagan and all the distinguished guests are here. It's an, it's an honor for me to be here at the Reagan Library to speak with all of you today. And I want to thank Mrs. Reagan for her gracious invitation. There's been a lot of thrilling things that have happened to me over the last 20 months. And people tend to become a little passe after a while about things that happen. And I have a former law partner who's with me tonight who majors in passe, my friend Bill Palatucci. And I called him and I said to him, OK, I got something that's even going to impress you. <laughs> and I read him this letter over the phone. And I said, it's signed by Nancy Reagan. And he said, OK, I'm impressed. <laughs> so it's great to be here, Mrs. Reagan, and thank you for your invitation. Ronald Reagan believed in this country. He embodied the strength, the perseverance, and the faith that has propelled immigrants for centuries to embark on dangerous journeys to come here, to give up all that was familiar for all that was possible. He judged that as good as things were and had been for many Americans, they could and would be better for more Americans in the future. It's this vision for our country that guided his administration over the course of eight years. His commitment to making America stronger, better, more resilient is what allowed him the freedom to challenge conventional wisdom, reach across party lines, and dare to put results ahead of political opportunism. Everybody in this room and in countless other rooms across this great country has his or her favorite Ronald Reagan story. For me, that story happened 30 years ago, in August of 1981. The air traffic controllers, in violation of their contracts, went on strike. President Reagan ordered them back to work, making clear that those who refused would be fired. In the end, thousands refused, and thousands were fired. I cite this incident not as a parable of labor relations, but as a parable of principle. Ronald Reagan was a man who said what he meant and meant what he said. Those who thought he was bluffing were sadly mistaken. Reagan's demand was not an empty political ploy. It was leadership, pure and simple. Reagan said it best himself. He said, I think he convinced people who might have thought otherwise that I meant what I said. And incidentally, I would have been just as forceful if I thought management had been wrong in the dispute. That was Ronald Reagan, fairness. I recall this pivotal moment for another reason as well. 
Most Americans at the time and since no doubt viewed Reagan's firm handling of the PATCO strike as a domestic matter, a confrontation between the president and a public sector union. But this misses a critical point in my view. To quote a phrase from another American moment, the whole world was watching. Thanks to newspapers and television then and increasingly now the internet and social media, what happens here doesn't stay here. This is not Vegas. <laughs> Another way of saying what I've just described is that Americans do not have the luxury of thinking that what we have long viewed as purely domestic matters have no consequences beyond our borders. To the contrary, what we say and what we do at home affects how others see us and in turn affects what it is they say and they do. America's role and significance in the world is defined first and foremost by who we are at home. It is defined by how we conduct ourselves with each other. It is defined by how we deal with our own problems. It is determined in large measure by how we set an example for the world. We tend to still understand foreign policy as something designed by officials in the State Department and carried out by ambassadors and others overseas. And to some extent, it still is. But one of the most powerful forms of foreign policy is the example we set. This is where it's instructive to harken back to President Reagan and the PATCO affair. President Reagan's willingness to articulate a determined stand and then carry it out at home sent the signal that the occupant of the Oval Office was someone who could be predicted to stand by his friends and to stand up to his adversaries. If President Reagan would do that at home, leaders around the world realized that he would do it abroad as well. Principle would not stop at the water's edge. The Reagan who challenged Soviet aggression or who attacked a Libya that supported terror was the same Reagan who stood up years before to Patco at home for what he believed was right. All this should and does have meaning for us today. The image of the United States around the world is not what it was, it is not what it can be, and it is not what it needs to be. This country pays a price whenever our economy fails to deliver rising living standards to our citizens, which is exactly what has been the case for years now. We pay a price when our political system cannot come together and agree on the difficult but necessary steps to rein in entitlement spending or to reform our tax system. We pay a price when special interests win out over the collective national interest. We are seeing just this in the partisan divide that has so far made it impossible to reduce our staggering deficits and to create an environment in which there is more job creation than job destruction. This is where the contrast between what has happened in New Jersey and what is happening in Washington, D.C. is the most clear. In New Jersey over the last 20 months, you have actually seen divided government that's working. To be clear, it doesn't mean we don't have argument or acrimony. I think you've all seen my YouTube videos. <laughs> there are serious disagreements, sometimes expressed loudly, you know, Jersey style. <laughs> yeah, a few New Jerseyans out there. Well, listen, here's what we did. We identified the problems. We proposed specific means to fix them. We educated the public on the dire consequences of inaction. And then we compromised on a bipartisan basis to get results. In other words, we did what government is supposed to do. We took action. That's what people expect. How do we do this? How do we do it? Through leadership and compromise. Leadership and compromise is the only way you can balance two budgets with over $13 billion in deficits without raising taxes while protecting core services. Leadership and compromise is the only way you reform New Jersey's pension and health benefits system that was collectively 
$121 billion underfunded. Leadership and compromise is the only way you can cap the highest property taxes in the nation and cap the interest arbitration awards for public employees of some of the most powerful public sector unions in America at no greater than a 2% increase. In New Jersey, we've done this and more because the executive branch has not sat by and waited for others to go first to suggest solutions to our state's most difficult problems. <laughs> being a mayor, being a governor, being a president means leading by taking risk on the most important issues of the day. That has happened in Trenton. In New Jersey, we've done this with a legislative branch held by the opposite party because it's led by two people who have more often put the interests of our state above the partisan politics of their caucuses. And that's why I call them my friends. Our bipartisan accomplishments in New Jersey have helped to set a tone that has taken hold across many other states. It is a simple but powerful message. Lead on the tough issues by telling your citizens the truth about the depth of our challenges. Tell them the truth about the difficulty of the solutions. This is the only effective way to lead America during these troubling times. In Washington, on the other hand, we have watched as we drift from conflict to conflict with little or no resolution. We watch a president who once talked about the courage of his convictions but still has yet found the courage to lead. We watch a Congress at war with itself because they're unwilling to leave campaign-style politics at the Capitol's door. The result is a debt ceiling limitation debate that made our democracy appear as if we could no longer effectively govern ourselves. And still we continue to wait and hope that our president will finally stop being a bystander in the Oval Office. We hope that he will shake off the paralysis that has made it impossible for him to take on the really big things that are so obvious to all Americans and to a watching and anxious world. Yes, we hope, we hope. Because each and every time the president lets a moment to act pass him by, his failure is our failure too. The failure to stand up for the bipartisan death solutions of the Simpson-Bowles Commission, a report the president asked for himself. The failure to act on the country's crushing unemployment, the failure to act on ever-expanding and rapidly eroding entitlement programs, the failure to discern pork barrel spending from real infrastructure investment. You see, the rule for effective governance is simple. It's the one Ronald Reagan knew by heart. It's the one he successfully employed with Social Security and the Cold War. When there is a problem, you fix it. That's what you do. That's what he did. That's the job we've been sent to do, and you cannot wait for someone else to do it when you're sitting in the Oval Office. We pay for this failure of leadership many, many times over. The domestic price is obvious. Growth slows. High levels of unemployment persist. And we make ourselves even more vulnerable to the unpredictable behavior of skittish markets or the political decisions of our lenders. But there's also a foreign policy price to pay. To begin with, we diminish our ability to influence the thinking and ultimately the behavior of others. There is no better way to persuade other societies around the world to become more democratic and more market-oriented than to show that our democracy and our markets work better than any other system. Why should we care? Why should it matter to us? Well, we should care because we believe, as President Reagan did, that democracy is the best protector of human dignity and freedom. And we know this because history shows that mature democracies are less likely to resort to force against their own people or their neighbors. We should care because we believe in free and open trade, as exports are the best creators of high-paying jobs here, and imports are a means to increase consumer choice and keep our prices down. Around the world, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, people are debating their own political and economic futures right now. 
We have a stake in the outcome of those debates. For example, a Middle East that is largely democratic and at peace will be a Middle East that accepts Israel, rejects terrorism, and is a dependable source of energy for the world. There is no better way to enforce the likelihood that others in the world will opt for more open societies and economies than to demonstrate at home that our own system is working. You know, a lot's being said in this election season about American exceptionalism. Now, implicit in such statements is that we are different and, yes, better, in the sense that our democracy, our economy, and our people have delivered. But for American exceptionalism to truly deliver hope and a sterling example to the rest of the world, it must be demonstrated, not just asserted. They will be more likely to follow our example and lead if they see what we're doing and are allowed to emulate it, not just hear words out of our mouths. Now, at one time in our history, our greatness was a reflection of our country's innovation, our determination, our ingenuity, and the strength of our democratic institutions. When there was a crisis in the world, America found a way to come together to help our allies and to fight our enemies. When there was a crisis at home, we put aside parochialism and put the greater public interest first. And in our system, we did it through strong presidential leadership. We did it through Reagan-like leadership. Unfortunately, through our own domestic political conduct of late, we have failed to live up to our own traditional of, tradition of exceptionalism. Today, our role and ability to affect change has been diminished because of our own problems and our own inability to effectively deal with them. To understand this clearly, one need only look at comments from the recent meeting of the European finance ministers in Poland. Here's what the finance minister of Austria had to say, quote, I found it peculiar that even though the Americans have significantly worse fundamental data than the Eurozone, that they tell us what we should do. I had expected that when Secretary Geithner tells us how he sees the world, that he would listen to what we have to say. You see, without strong leadership at home, without our domestic house in order, we are taking ourselves out of the equation. Over and over, we're allowing the rest of the world to set the tone without American influence because of our failings. Now, I understand full well that succeeding at home and setting an example is not enough. The United States must be prepared to act. We must be prepared to lead. And this takes resources, resources for defense, for intelligence, for homeland security, for diplomacy. The United States will only be able to sustain a leadership position around the world if those resources are there. But the necessary resources will only be there if the foundations of the American economy are healthy. So our economic health is a national security issue as well. Without the authority that comes from real American exceptionalism, earned American exceptionalism, we cannot do for good for other countries. We cannot continue to be a beacon of hope for the world to aspire to for their future generations. If Ronald Reagan faced today's challenges, we know exactly what he would do. He would face our domestic problems directly, with leadership, and without political calculation. We would take an honest and tough approach to solving our long-term debt and deficit problem through reforming our entitlement programs and our tax code. We would confront our unemployment crisis by giving certainty to business about our tax and regulatory future. We would unleash American entrepreneurship through long-term tax reform, not short-term tax gimmickry. And we would reform our K-12 education system by applying free market reform principles to education rewarding outstanding teachers. <laughs> rewarding outstanding teachers, demanding accountability from everyone in the system, increasing competition through choice and charters, and making the American free public education system once again the envy of the world. 
The guiding principle should be simple and powerful. The educational interests of children must always be put ahead of the comfortable status quo of adults. And the United States must become more discriminating in what we try to accomplish abroad. We certainly cannot force others to adopt our principles through coercion. Local realities count. We cannot have forced makeovers of our society, other societies, and our image. We need to limit ourselves overseas to what is in our national interest so that we can rebuild the foundations of American power here at home. Foundations that need to be rebuilt in part so that we can sustain a leadership role in the world for decades to come. The argument for getting our own house in order is not an argument for turning our back on the world. I want to be clear. We cannot and should not do that. First of all, our economy is dependent on what we export and import. And as we learned the hard way 10 years ago, we as a country and a people are vulnerable to terrorists armed with box cutters and bombs and viruses, be they computer generated or man-made. We need to remain vigilant and be prepared to act with our friends and allies to discourage, deter, or defend against traditional aggression, to stop the spread of nuclear materials and weapons and the means to deliver them, and to continue to deprive terrorists of the ways, means, and opportunity to succeed and kill our people. I realize that what I'm calling for requires a lot of our elected officials and a lot of our people. I plead guilty, but I also plead guilty to optimism. Like Ronald Reagan, I believe in what this country and its citizens can accomplish if they understand what is being asked of them and how we all benefit if they meet the challenge. There's no doubt in my mind that we as a country and as a people are up for the challenge. Our democracy is strong. Our economy is still the world's largest. Innovation and risk-taking is a part of our collective DNA. There is no better place in the world for investment. And above all, we have a demonstrated record as a people and a nation of rising up to meet any challenge. But today, the biggest challenge we must meet is the one we present to ourselves. To not become a nation that places entitlement ahead of accomplishment. To not become a country that places comfortable lies ahead of difficult truths. To not become a people that thinks so little of ourselves that we demand no sacrifice from each other. We are a better people than that, and we must demand a better nation than that. The America I speak of is the America Ronald Reagan challenged us to be every day. Frankly, it's the America his leadership helped us to be. Through our conduct, our deeds, our demonstrated principles, and our sacrifice for each other and for the greater good of our nation, we become a country emulated throughout the world, not just because of what we said, but because of what we've done, both at home and abroad. If we are to reach real American exceptionalism, American exceptionalism that can set an example for freedom around the world, we must lead with purpose and unity. Now, in 2004, Illinois State Senator Barack Obama gave us a window into his vision for American leadership. At the Democratic National Convention's keynote address, he said this, now even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us, the spin masters, the negative ad peddlers, who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well, I say to them tonight, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America and a Latino America and an Asian America. There is the United States of America. Well, now, seven years later, President Obama prepares to divide our nation to achieve re-election. This is not a leadership style. This is a re-election strategy. 
telling those who are scared and struggling that the only way their lives can get better is to diminish the success of others, trying to cynically convince those who are suffering that the American economic pie is no longer a growing one that can provide more prosperity for all who work hard, insisting that we must tax and take and demonize those who have already achieved the American dream. That may turn out to be a good re-election strategy, Mr. President, but it is a demoralizing message for America. What happened? What happened to State Senator Obama? When did he decide to become a one of the dividers he spoke so eloquently of in 2004? There is, of course, a different choice. That choice is the way Ronald Reagan led the Amer America in the 1980s. That approach to leadership is best embodied in the words he spoke to the nation during his farewell address in 1989. He made clear he was not there just marking time that he was there to make a difference. And then, of course, he spoke of the city on the hill and how he made it stronger. And he said, I've spoken to the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was tall, proud city, built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and see it still. That is American exceptionalism. Not a punchline in a political speech, but a vision followed by a set of principled actions that made us the envy of the world. Not a re-election strategy, but an American revitalization strategy. We will be that again, but not until we demand that our leaders stand tall by telling the truth, confronting our shortcomings, celebrating our successes, and once again, leading the world because of what we have been able to actually accomplish. Only when we do that will we finally ensure that our children and grandchildren will live in a second American century. We owe them, as well as ourselves and those who came before us, nothing less. Thank you again for inviting me. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Christie has been gracious enough, gracious enough to uh, agree to answer questions from the audience. What I'd like you to do is uh, pay attention to the one rule we have, which is uh, before you ask your question, if you could wait for one of our staff that are in the aisles to hand you a microphone so it can be picked up. Uh, and with that, let's get on to the questions uh, right over here. Hello, Governor Christie. Could you please tell us more about how you think our immigration crisis in this country should be handled, as well as the education expense associated with this problem? Sure. Well, 
First of all, there's some very basic principles that we need to stand by as a country. First of all, our borders have to be secure. And we have done an awful job of doing that. And we have to take every step necessary to make sure that happens. Second, we have to make sure that we have a fair way to allow people to continue to legally immigrate into this country and to immigrate at numbers that make sense. This country is built on immigrants. My relatives were immigrants. Probably so were many, or if not most, of yours in this room. And we need to make sure that we continue to be a country that expands the American economic pie by expanding the innovation and the thoughts and the dreams and the hopes of having people come here looking for a better life. Now, as to educational expense, I've dealt with this problem in New Jersey, and I need to be crystal clear about it. I want every child who comes to New Jersey to be educated, but I do not believe that for those people who came here illegally, that we should be subsidizing with taxpayer money through in-state tuition their education. And let me be very clear from my perspective, that is not a heartless position. That is a common sense position. Governor Christie, you're known as a straight shooter, one not given to playing games. Can you tell us what's going on here? Are you reconsidering or are you standing firm? Listen, I, I have to tell you the truth. You folks are an incredible disappointment as an audience. <laughs> the fact that that took to second question. <laughs> Shows you people are off your game. <laughs> that is not American exceptionalism. <laughs> uh, listen, I'd be really, really succinct about this. I saw something great today on the Politico website, and I don't mean to be an advertiser for Politico, but they put a minute and 53 seconds of my answers strung back to back to back to back together um, on the question of running for the presidency. Everyone go to politico.com. It's right on the front page. I'm not going to bore you with it now. Click on it. Those are the answers. Next question. <laughs> oh, come on. You know, you know, grumble? Wait a second. Before you go now, okay, since we're having some grumbling, all right, I have rules too. Now, I've done 56 town hall meetings in 20 months as governor of New Jersey. And we have all the same rules the Reagan Library has, you know, wait for the microphone, say who you are, all that stuff. But we have a fourth rule that's really important in New Jersey. And let me tell you here, even though I am on foreign soil, <laughs> I'm going to enforce this rule. And here's what the rule says. The rule is, listen, there could be people in this audience who don't like one of my answers who would disagree with me. And we welcome those people to stand up and to express their disagreement. And if you express it in a reasonable and respectful manner, you will get a reasonable and respectful disagreement in return. However, <laughs> however, if this is the day that you decide you want to impress your friends on television, if this is the day you decide you want to take the governor of New Jersey out for a walk, <laughs> I will give you the rule I give in New Jersey. For purposes of this evening's event, we are all from New Jersey. <laughs> and what that means is you give it, you're getting it back. Two-part two, two question. If sure. you were running the country, what would you do to wean people off of the entitlements that are so rampant in the country, number one? And number two, what would you do to turn around the employment picture and restore hope to the country at the same time? All right, first on entitlements. We already have an example of what we've done in New Jersey. Now, in New Jersey, the equivalent on the federal level to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are public sector pensions and health benefits provided to public sector workers. I mentioned in the speech that those two items were $121 billion underfunded when I took office. Now listen to that number, $121 billion underfunded, that's four times our annual state budget. 
So what did we do? I went out in September of 2010, eight months into my term, and I put out a specific plan. Not a plan that says I'd like to rein in these expenses. <laughs> and if I could come to agreement with the other side, I'll tell you what they are. Now, <laughs> that is not leadership, okay? I said some very specific things. I said to public sector union members, you're gonna to have to contribute more and significantly more to your pensions. That we are not gonna pay COLAs any longer until your funds reach 80% of solvency. We are going to make sure that only full-time people get into those pension systems so they benefit from them. And on the health insurance side, for public sector workers in New Jersey, when I came into office, many of them were paying nothing, nothing for their health insurance. Now we have negotiated and passed legislation that says that everyone has to pay a percentage of their premium, up to 35% of the premium on a sliding scale. And the legislation drops that, that grid into every collective bargaining agreement from the school board all the way up through the state level. Now, I could tell you that I made a lot of people unhappy with that. And I'll tell you one quick story. The people, some of the people I made the most unhappy were New Jersey firefighters. Now, I honor them for what they do, and they are extraordinary public servants. But I went to the firefighters' convention two days after I made this proposal, in September of uh, 2010, um, in Wildwood, New Jersey, on the boardwalk. Yeah, uh, about 4,000 firefighters in the room. And uh, your, your governor was introduced to them, and uh, let's just say that I did not get the reception you all gave me tonight. <laughs> And they continued to boo. When I got up to the podium, they were booing more. And when they saw me, they really started booing. And then I said, come on, you can do better than that. And they did. <laughs> um, and then, uh, uh, don't skip ahead to the next story. <laughs> You're killing me. So, in a second. So, this is in essence, in essence, what I said to the firefighters that day. I said, understand you're scared, and I understand you're angry, and I understand you feel betrayed, and I know why. Because for 20 years, governors of both parties have been coming to this convention every year, telling you they're gonna give you more benefits and a bigger pension, and you weren't gonna have to pay for it, someone else was going to. And every year they voted for increased benefits for you, and they never put any money in to pay for it. And so now, you sit here angry and scared, and feeling betrayed, and I understand why. But here's what I don't get. Why are you booing the first guy who came into the room and actually told you the truth? Because there's no political upside for me in doing that. And what I told them was, you may hate me now, and you may vote me out three years from now and put someone else in, but if we do what I'm saying we should do 10 years from now, you're going to be looking on the internet for my address to send me a thank you note because you're going to be collecting a pension when otherwise you would not have been. Now, that's what we need to do on the federal level. We need to tell people the truth. And the truth is that Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security to a lesser extent are eating away at every dollar we raise in taxation. And so what we need to do is to sit down and get to a common sense approach to reduce the benefits to means test some of this stuff and to get people who don't need it to stop taking it so we can give it to the people at an affordable price who do need it. Now listen, that's common sense. I mean, I'm no genius, clearly. <laughs> but here's the thing, why can't we do that? Here's why, because every time someone says it, every time someone goes near it, they get vilified and then they read the polls and they go, well, okay, here's the thing. Real leaders, they don't read polls, they change polls. Um, Governor Christie, I'm a Jersey girl. Yeah, where from? Um, a borough of Middlesex in the county of Middlesex. Excellent. 
And um, I've been here for two and a half years. My family is all still in New Jersey. And I just want to let you know, you make us so proud to be New Jerseyans and so proud to be Americans. And my Italian mother, she told me to tell you that you got to run for president. <laughs> Well, I'm going to press my luck here and respond to that. Um, if I make you proud to be in New Jersey and proud to be American, and your Italian mother wants me to run for president, what the hell are you doing in California? <laughs> Get back to New Jersey. Let's go. Come home. Come home, for God's sake. What are you doing out here? I got a plane. We can, you can come right back now if you want. <laughs> Yeah, hey, come on. Meet me by the side over there. We'll take you home. Okay. Uh, Governor, right up here in the balcony up on top. Right up here. Uh, Governor. Getting more taxpayers one at a time. <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Governor Christie, all kidding aside, <laughs> I've, been, I've been listening to you tonight. You're a very powerful and eloquent speaker. You know how to tell the American people what they need to hear. And I say this from the bottom of my heart from my daughter who's right here and my grandchildren who are at home. I know New Jersey needs you, but I really implore you. I really do. I'm not, this isn't funny. I mean this with all my heart. We can't wait another four years to, tw to, to 2016. And I, I really implore you to, as a citizen of this country, to please, sir, to reconsider. Not, don't even say anything tonight, of course you wouldn't. Go home and really think about it. <laughs> Please. Do it. Do it for my daughter. Do it for our grandchildren. Do it for our sons. Please, sir, don't. We need you. Your country needs you to run for president. <laughs> let me let me just say let me just say this because there are a lot of people who have asked me um, about this over the course of the last number of uh, weeks and months, and uh, this is all I'll say about that tonight is that I hear exactly what you're saying and I feel the passion with which you say it, and it touches me. Because I could tell you, I'm just a kid from Jersey who feels like I'm the luckiest guy in the world to have the opportunity that I have to be the governor of my state. And so people say to me all the time now, when folks like you say those kind of things, for as many months as it's being said, like, you know, governor, I got, you know, why don't they just leave you alone? I've already given your answer. Isn't it a burden? And what I say to you tonight and say to everybody else who is nice enough to applaud what she said is that it isn't a burden. I mean, the fact of the matter is that anybody who has an ego, ego large enough to say, oh, please, please, please stop asking me to be leader of the free world. <laughs> it's, it's such a burden. If, if you could please just stop. Um, I mean, what kind of crazy egomaniac would you have to be to say, oh, geez, please stop, stop. It's extraordinarily flattering. But by the same token, that heartfelt message you gave me is also not a reason for me to do it. That reason has to reside inside me. And so that's what I've said all along, is I know without ever having met President Reagan, that he must have felt deeply in his heart that he was called to that moment to lead our country. And so my answer to you is just this. I thank you for what you're saying, and I take it in and I'm listening to every word of it and feeling it too. And please don't ever think for a second that I feel like I'm 
important enough in this world that somehow what you're saying is a problem for me. It's a great, great honor. I'm extraordinarily flattered, and I really appreciate you being willing to stand up and say it with the passion you did. Um, that's why this country is a great place, because of folks like you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Governor. On that note, uh, if I could just ask everyone to remain in their seats so that Mrs. Reagan and Governor Christie can exit, we'd really appreciate it. And Governor, we cannot thank you enough for gracing us with your presence. It's been terrific. Thank you.